because the world is facing climate change, we're going to have to do something about the amount of greenhouse gases, particularly carbon, in the atmosphere. Government has committed to hit net zero emissions of carbon by 2050, and trees are important for that because they directly remove carbon from the atmosphere as they grow. And they're actually also very, very good at it. We know forests are a big store of carbon. They have the capacity to absorb carbon and store it in different uh, parts of the forest ecosystem. So when this carbon is absorbed, it can be stored in the wood, or the uh, carbon can be stored in roots and in uh, soil which remains there unless it's been disturbed. Well, part of our uh, climate change adaptation is to find the right species that will uh, allow maximum maximization of the carbon sequestration. So to do that, we need to first understand how much carbon each species uh, absorb and how the climate will affect the carbon uh, absorption. So we have a series of established sites where we measure carbon sequestration for different types of ecosystems. And using the data we're measuring today and using mathematical models that uh, use the climate scenarios for the future, we can predict how much this species will absorb in a future climate uh, scenario. So we do a series of measurements, starting from carbon moving from the atmosphere down to the forest ecosystem. Increment of trees and uh, translate that to carbon. We do light intensities underneath and above uh, the canopy. We do measurements of water uptake and measurements of carbon uh, emitted from the soil as part of the natural process and uh, measurements of the litter fall that goes into the soil. So we try to uh, understand every process within the forest ecosystem, how carbon is distributed and how it's a uh, cycle. So we can get a full picture of the greenhouse gas balance in terms of CO2. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we do measurements of other greenhouse gases from forest ecosystem and other land. So we look at uh, methane and nitrous oxide and how much that is emitted from soils which have the potential to contribute to the greenhouse gas balance. So to maximize the carbon sequestration that we can do by land use, we need to be able to understand not only forest ecosystems, how much carbon they absorb, but different land uh, uses. So alongside forest uh, stands, we measure grasslands and uh, uh, agroforestry, so we can understand and compare the different sites. And then we use this data to maximize carbon sequestration uh, for net zero solutions. So once we measure how much carbon our forest ecosystem absorbs, a large amount of that carbon is removed by uh, harvesting operations, both as uh, timber, but also there is some release due to the operation because of uh, disturbances in soil. Now, the soils also absorb a, a very big amount of uh, carbon. So this carbon has uh, a potential to stay there as long as we preserve the forest and we uh, minimize the disruption of uh, the forest by doing forest management uh, practices that are uh, low impact and have the potential to sustain and increase the carbon storage uh, in our forests. So what is important for us is not only to measure how much carbon our forests uh, absorb, but also where this carbon is going, how long it's staying, uh, which products they've been converted to, and of course, what is the lifetime of these uh, products so we can understand how quickly this carbon that we capture from the forest is going to be returned back to the atmosphere. 
We know that climate change is going to bring us quite a lot of uncertainty, especially with a lot of predicted higher temperatures and uh, uncertainty in the amount of precipitation that forests uh, receive. So we do need to adapt our uh, forestry and the species that we're choosing. Hence, we need to have decision support tools able to provide us options there, which uh, gives us the most suitable species for a future climate. There's a much more fundamental drive behind this project, and that's trying to change the way that we make decisions about the land and the environment in general. The uptake of a decision uh, to, for example, uh, change from growing agricultural crops into planting trees involves a lot of complex decision making. Suppose you were thinking of planting a set amount of forestry and you've got an area that you're considering. Well, first of all, you need to think, every time I change land use in uh, any particular area, it has these multiple effects. Yes, there's a tree now going to be on it. And I can see how well that tree grows and I can see how that changes when I grow different species of tree on that area. Now, together, those two things are going to determine the amount of carbon because the tree is soaking up carbon, but actually uh, you're actually reducing the amount of carbon that's uh, coming out of agriculture at the same time. But you're also reducing the amount of food. Now, in a country like the UK, that doesn't change the amount of food that we eat. So where's that food coming from? Well, it's coming from overseas a lot of the time. And you therefore need to track all the way through that sort of food web to get an accurate figure for what you're really doing to help fight climate change. But there's other things. That's going to affect biodiversity. It's going to affect it a lot because, you know, movement from agriculture to uh, woodland is one of the most extreme changes that you can do in a country like this. What's more, going back out through the exports, you're going to have an effect on biodiversity out in those other countries that you've affected by your imports. You're going to affect water quality and that will have uh, effects uh, both on uh, the quality of those waterways but also the, um, the, the life that lives in them. You're going to have an effect on flooding. You're going to have an effect on the ability of local populations to recreate in those areas. Now, all of these things need to be considered, and that's what our uh, decision support system actually allows the decision maker to understand. It looks at land use change from, the, first of all, the perspective of the farmer or the landowner. And we look at, well, what are the incentives and risks that a farmer would face if we actually, for example, changed um, a policy over a period where we know lots of other things are changing as well, like climate, like the price of other crops, that sort of stuff. So that's one side of it. But the other side is really for government and to say, OK, we have a good understanding of a farmer's response to the things that you can change. How do you want to change them? Here's a lot of information available to you to understand what the consequences of different options will be. And it, there's even a very advanced part of the tool which says, right, that's a complex question. Instead of that, tell us what outcomes you want and we will tell you what the feasible policies are that will give you those outcomes. The GGR project has a lot of modelling where it's taking some of the country's most state-of-the-art, high-resolution and expensive to run simulators of tree growth and soil carbon and it's using those to sort of forecast what would happen um, under various, if you planted in various places at various times for different species all the way out into the future. To get that from the model itself would require many months and a fairly large budget on that supercomputer. What I do on the project is develop 
AI that can take just a few of those simulations and predict what would happen everywhere. So essentially the AI learns the models. Um, and then we develop more AI that allows the models to talk to each other so that a user can play in an app and sort of move a slider and say, what happens if I plant a tree here, here and here? Or what happens if I roll out a policy to give um, a certain kind of payment structure for land use change? And they get an answer in a second on their screen for everywhere. Um, and the answer is not from the models, because that would not take a second, but it's from the AI that learned the models. So the AI allows you to say, okay, well, what's the space of the possible? Uh, and how do we traverse it? So we showed a really nice example to our users this morning uh, of a site that Forestry England manage, and it divides into 47 places you could plant. And you can plant all of them, none of them, three, something like that. And I asked the users, how many possible planting strategies are there that we would have to ask the models to explore? Uh, the answer is 140 trillion, just for 47 different cells you could plant in. Uh, the AI allows you to not just say, this is the best one, but to say, here are all the possible ones, and here's a nice way of looking at the different flavors of the possible without committing to, there's a, we'll just try four and see what happens. The modeling won't stop when this project's finished. Modeling will never stop. Um, there, are, there are always things missing from models and they're always improving. The vision for the AI that we produce is that they, they automatically learn the models. So when the new version of the model comes uh, and contains all of that, that science and that expertise, um, the AI is able to interrogate it enough to learn it without me being involved or my team doing it. Um, and so that the users will always have access to the latest modeling. Planting trees is a very long-term decision. Uh, changing the way you use your own land, particularly if it's a farm or something, to change it to woodland is a very long-term decision. So they're rightly cautious about making the right decision. And I guess our technology will hopefully give them confidence that at least the best models say that this is a good thing to do, or if it's not, then at least if they can look at some other strategies. So I hope it will speed up uptake, but I don't think that, I don't know that there's a lack of willingness to, to uh, change. In Work Package 8, which is the user engagement work package, um, we work one-on-one -on -one with individual users to understand the decisions that they're making, the priorities that they have, the constraints that they face, um, and any targets that they would like to meet. And using this information, we can create bespoke decision tools for those users. What's really great about the co-design process is that we can iterate different tool designs, uh, refine and work with our users to make sure that we have the kinds of outcomes that they're interested in and the functionality within the tool that they need. Um, and once we have that, we can then deploy and beta test with our user groups. And the user advisory group itself helps us to look at how the kinds of technologies in each bespoke tool can be rolled out um, to be useful to other stakeholders um, making decisions in the same sorts of areas. Um, so a whole collection of different outcomes brought together within decision support tools. So single focus decision making is now the cause of the biggest challenges that we face. We have knocked the equilibrium of the climate off course. Nobody set out to do that. Nobody deliberately thought, let's go and pollute the planet. They thought, let's make this widget. Let's uh, expand this factory. All of those seem perfectly reasonable decisions when you just look at that single focus. But when you bring in the fact that this is a system, there are other things happening at the same time, you end up with problems like climate change. Once you bring these different disciplines together, you find that you can answer questions that could never be answered by any one of those disciplines uh, working individually. And that's really important in this century. So I do 
feel pretty positive about this uh, project as a genuine contribution to what I see as the most important extension of uh, research that actually um, uh, humans are undertaking today.